Good morning, this is Pastor Jerry, and welcome to another edition of Men of the Word, a ministry of Calvary Chapel Heartland, uh, right here in Fort Valley, Georgia. And as we've gone through this study of Habakkuk, uh, we're finishing it up today, we have seen uh, that we are often the same way as Habakkuk. We question God during our trials, and, and <clears throat> you know, when we question God, everybody does, it can either drive us farther away from God or it can drive us to God to find the answer of what he's doing in our life. And as we've seen, Habakkuk, you know, chose the latter. It drove him to God to realize who God was. And as we saw last week, he presented these five woes to the people who would uh, were going to uh, exact God's judgment on Judah uh, and woe in the Bible is very indicative of a trauma. It's not like, you know, just a bad thing that's happening. Woe usually means that something terrible is going to happen, something very bad. Uh, and through all of these things, God shows us his power, his majesty, his grace. And in his judgment, he shows us mercy. And in all of these things, he is righteous. Uh, so for me, this small three chapter book that we've been going through is personal uh, because just over the past few weeks, uh, I sought God on a, on a particular matter and, and kind of struggled with it and wondered, you know, God, where are you at? And, and don't you hear my prayers? Uh, only for God to show me all the many ways he's blessed me and encouraged me and restored my joy and my hope. So as we go through trials, as we go through things that frustrate us, as we go through things that are difficult to pass through, let it turn us to God and not away from God. And I came to the same conclusion that we're going to find here as we go through chapter 3 that Habakkuk did, that God is in control, and though we may go through these trials, he is always present, providing hope, and mercy during our struggles. So let's begin in Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigiano, <laughs> which is an unknown, it doesn't, we don't know what it means. It also appears in Psalm 7. There's only two times it's mentioned in, in the Bible. And so we don't really know exactly what that phrase means. In verse 2 it says, O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of your years, that is, before the end of this particular trial. Show me during this trial what you're doing. And then it goes on, it says, in the midst of the years, make it known or make it understood. Help me to understand, God, exactly what you're doing. And then it finishes that verse, it says, in wrath, remember mercy. Now Habakkuk heard this message from God. Remember, he had a vision, and he was afraid. And, and that fear was more of a deep respect for God's power and God's actions. See, it wasn't just that we can be afraid like of thunder and lightning and storms and that, <clears throat> but that fear is more than just a respect. This was... Habakkuk having such a deep, overwhelming respect for God and how he works uh, that it was a godly fear, a reverent fear. By faith, he was afraid because he knew that God meant business and that God was faithful to carry out exactly what he had shown the prophet. And remember Jonah? I mean, Jonah knew God also. And Jonah, because he knew God's heart, he ran from God's calling because he selfishly didn't want to see repentance come to Nineveh. But it's kind of a different story here in Habakkuk. Habakkuk cried out for God to revive his work in his nation and personally within the prophet himself. He also wanted God to make it known from where the revival came, not from man or a man, but from God alone. You see, I... I don't know about you, but I love it when, when God works in such a way 
that there's no other way it could have been done except for God. And that he is the only possible solution for what has happened. We see that when people who are ill get healed and the doctors are saying there's nothing else we can do, but God says, I'm not done with you yet. And so to me, those are incredible encouragements when we see God move in that way, when there's no other way for anybody else to work this out or to manipulate it, but it's God that shows up and accomplishes his will alone. So in the coming judgment, Habakkuk also asked God for mercy. And, you know, it seems kind of a paradox to ask for mercy in God's judgment. So it's, Habakkuk is saying, you know, I know we deserve judgment. I know that this judgment is because of our sin, but show us your mercy. And so God can supply mercy that we need to get through the trials we face, even when they're the direct result of our own action. God can supply mercy. So the next passage, as described by Matthew Henry, and this is verses 3 through 16, Matthew Henry said, God appeared in his glory. All the powers of nature are shaken, and the course of nature is changed, but all is for the salvation of God's own people. Even what seems least likely shall be made to work for their salvation. Hereby is given a type and figure of the redemption of the world by Jesus Christ. It is for salvation with thine anointed. So a beautiful picture of what we're about to read. So beginning in verse 3, it says, God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. He had rays flashing from his hand, and there was, and there his power was hidden. So Teman and Mount Paran are both east of Judah, and the picture is, this great picture in these few verses, is like a glorious sunrise. The sun rises from the east, and I love to see beautiful, colorful sunrises. And I've often, driving into work in my old Jeep, I'll pull off the side of the road and take a picture of a sunrise when it's just beautiful and colorful. And <clears throat> I enjoy that because to me, it's like God saying, good morning, and I'm still here watching over you. So it's just a blessing to me to see a beautiful sunrise. But then things change in verse 5. Habakkuk says, Before him went pestilence, and fever followed at his feet. So we went from God's glory directly into God's judgment. Verse 6 says, He stood and measured the earth. And you remember in Amos, when we were studying Amos, how Amos used a plumb line, and that plumb line is Jesus Christ. He is perfect righteousness. So God is measuring the earth by the plumb line, his plumb line, Jesus Christ, perfect righteousness, and the earth does not measure up. He looked and startled the nations. You know, a lot of people today are like that. They're going to wake up and see that God, who is God, and they're going to be startled. Just like we mentioned last week in Revelation, how pastors teaching through that, and all the nations the people in heaven, the people on the earth, and the people under the earth. That is, the people who are redeemed, the people who are alive on the earth at the time, and the people who have passed away before that time. Everybody is going to praise God. They're going to be startled by God. They're going to praise him even if they don't think he exists, even if they hate him. No matter what our condition is in our relationship with God, whether we love him with all our heart or hate him with all of our heart, we are still going to praise God in the end. And then it says, And the everlasting mountains were scattered, and the perpetual hills bowed. His ways are everlasting. So there's a great picture in that. You know, when we go to the Smoky Mountains or the Rocky Mountains and we see these great mountains, we think, man, those things have been there forever, and they're going to always be there forever. But here, God's saying the only thing that's going to last forever is his ways. 
his word. That's the only thing that's eternal. These mountains are going to be moved and shifted as we studied in Revelation. Uh, they're going to change form. They're not everlasting, and the hills aren't perpetual. They are going to change form, and God's power can change their form, but his ways are everlasting. Verse 7 says, I saw the tent circushion in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian trembled, and these are enemies of Judah that God had already judged. Verse 8 goes on and says, O Lord, were you displeased with the rivers? Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea? That you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation. You see, God's movement in nature was not for judgment of nature. God used nature to judge mankind. It's for you and I to realize our desperate need for him and our desperate need for his salvation. Verse 9 continues and says, Your bow was made quite ready. Oaths were sworn over your arrows. You divided the earth and the rivers. The mountains saw you and trembled. The overflowing of the waters passed by, and the deep uttered its voice and lifted its hand on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their habitation, and the light of your arrows they went. At the, at the shining of your glittering spear, you march through the land with indignation. God is angry, and God uses nature to bring judgment at times on mankind. You trampled the nations in anger. Verse 13 says, You went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your anointed. See, God's whole purpose in his judgment is for us to return to him, for us to draw near to him. He takes no pleasure in judging us, and his judgment is not to drive us away. His judgment is meant for us to return to him. He's here to rescue us. Verse 13 continues, it says, You struck the head of the house of the wicked by laying bare from the foundation to the neck. Verse 14 says, You thrust through with his own arrows the head of his villages. They came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was like feasting on the poor in secret. You walk through the sea with your horses. Walk through the sea. Think of how deep the sea is. Through the heap of great waters. When I heard, my body trembled. My lips quivered. At the voice, rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled within myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. It's a beautiful picture of rescue. And when Habakkuk sees this, he's shriveled with it inside because he sees God coming. He's so overwhelmed with joy that he begins to quiver and shake. And it feels like his bones are about to cave in, but he knows his rescue is there. You see, verses 3 through 16, just as Matthew Henry said, give us a poetic view of God's power and his might and his strength. And the whole creation acknowledges God and bows to him. And he is the one who can direct nature, who does direct nature, who makes the mountains crumble and makes the earth quake makes the seas rise. He is the one that can and will use his own creation to exact judgment. And then the prophet acknowledges that God in his glory and power will do his own will when he brings judgment because his ways are everlasting, but it is also a picture of God's ultimate rescue of his own people, the people that he has called who is everyone, as we discussed last week? Whoever, if you're a whoever, God sent his son to die on the cross for you and to raise again the third day so that you could have eternal life. He paid your sin debt because he wants to rescue you. He wants to rescue us even though we've caused our trouble in our own life. He wants to rescue us even 
when we've caused the distress and we hate him, even though we hate him, he loves us still. You see, he battles through the enemy. He pierces the darkness. He makes himself known to us so that he can rescue us, even though through our sin we, we deserve judgment. In this, the prophet realizes that he may rest when he sees God's judgment at hand. and He does not have to live in fear of man. Why? Because he realizes that God's judgment is upon the wicked and his rescue is nearby. Isn't that awesome? This is even before they've gone into judgment. Habakkuk is realizing that he doesn't have to fear what's about to come because he knows that God has a purpose, and God has a purpose for you and I as well. And then Habakkuk 3.17, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. That is very swift and very agile. And he will make me to walk on my high heels. Remember we said those aren't ladies' shoes. That's the small mountains. And that's a picture of being sure and steady. So he wants to make us swift and agile and sure and steady. That's how our walk should be with Christ. When we're going through trouble, God wants to give us the strength to walk through swift and agile and smooth and steady so that we don't stumble, so that we stay afloat even though the world is in, a, in chaos and there's disaster that surrounds us. And he finishes that by saying to the chief musician with my stringed instrument. So it's a beautiful song. So with this from 1 Peter chapter 1, we'll end the study of Habakkuk. And next week we'll begin with Zephaniah. But 1 Peter 1.3 says, Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away and is reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. First Peter has given us the same type of encouragement our inheritance that God has given us is not corruptible. It can't be changed. Nobody can take it away from you or I. It's uncorruptible. It's undefiled. Nobody can tarnish it or change it. It's what God has given to us. And it doesn't fade away. And it's reserved in heaven, our future hope. And we are kept by the power of God. Who we just saw, God that moves creation, his creation, for mankind's rescue. He loves us. He wants us to know him. I hope today that's you. I hope today that you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. <clears throat> and if you are going through a difficult time, you're struggling in your faith, read that passage in 1 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> or in Habakkuk, go back and study the book. God wants you to know that regardless of the difficulties and the trials that you and I are passing through, we have a hope in Jesus Christ. We have a future inheritance, and he is going to watch over us, and he's going to bring us through this trial. He's going to reserve his mercy for us during this judgment. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the encouragement of Habakkuk. Lord, thank you for, <clears throat> even though we have questions at times, even though we don't understand how you're working, God, we don't have your mind. We don't have your perspective, your vision, God, we trust you in all things. God, help us to place our 100% of our hope with no other than you. 
Mankind is going to let us down. People are going to let us down. But God, you will never fail. You will never falter. You are always there. Thank you for what you have provided to us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. An inheritance, again, that is incorruptible and undefiled. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. Thank you for the hope and the joy you give us day by day. And we just pray that your word would go out and reach those who you intend for it to reach, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.